Welcome to Bobby Osinski's Inner Circle. I'm Bobby Osinski, and this is a show all about music, music production, and the music business. Today, we're going to take a look back at what happened in the music business in 2016 and take a look at what might happen in the year coming up. There's no guest in this episode, and for the most part, it's kind of short because it's a holiday. But I'm going to give you my best look back, my best overview at what just happened because it was a significant year. There was a lot that went on, and there's also a lot that's going to happen in the upcoming year. So we can make some predictions, and there are some things we know that are going to happen. I think you'll find this really interesting because we're in a very interesting music world right now. So last year was the year of the exclusive on streaming networks. Basically what that means is an artist would give Spotify or Apple Music or Tidal the exclusive right to stream their music for a certain amount of time. And this happened with just about every music service and most of the superstar artists had tried this. Whether this was actually something that helped the business or not is kind of up to speculation. Many say that the exclusive really doesn't help things, doesn't work, and in fact kind of impedes the success of an album or a single. And others look at it and say, well, wait a second, it really does help. And there's a number of instances, Drake being the big one, that kind of shows that. That being said, I personally think that the big winner in all this would be the streaming networks, would be the Spotify's, would be the Apple Music, and those are the big two that are doing it. Although, we're now seeing YouTube sneak in on this. YouTube was very interesting because this was the first year that streams actually overtook music YouTube views. So in other words, there were far more streams than there were views on YouTube of music product. So YouTube is trying to do something different. They're actually putting money into promotion. They're promoting their artists. Now, of course, this is always going to be the superstar artist. It's not going to be the indie artist. It's not going to be the B and C level artists. It's the superstars. And this is something that Apple Music has been doing for quite a while. So now we're seeing YouTube jump in this game. And of course, both of these companies have very, very deep pockets. And both of these companies don't need music to survive. Music is kind of a rounding error for both of them. So it's interesting in that they can beat the Spotify's and Pandora's of the world anytime because they have other products to sell. And I'm talking about Apple Music and Amazon and YouTube, which of course is owned by Google. Speaking of Amazon, Garth Brooks gave an exclusive of all of his music to Amazon Music Unlimited, which just launched. And of course, Amazon has been threatening to unleash a music service, and they finally came out with it. It's Amazon Music Unlimited. The interesting thing about Amazon Music Unlimited is the fact that there's two tiers. There's the regular $9.99 a month tier, and of course there's the $3.99 a month tier, but that's tied to the Amazon products. Amazon Echo, for instance. If you already own an Echo, then in fact you can get the cheaper tier. And I think we're going to start to see more of that. We're, we're going to see device-restricted music tiers that will happen. Don't be surprised if you see that coming from Apple in the future. Speaking of cheap tiers, it's been rumored that Apple Music is coming out with an $8, $7.99 a month tier. Amazon, of course, has their $3.99 a month. And iHeartRadio has one that's $4.99 a month. But of course, all you're doing is listening to radio, but it has the advantage of you can actually treat radio as if it were an independent stream coming from a Spotify or an Apple Music or Tidal or one of those services. So that's kind of interesting. How many people are going to buy that? Well, we'll see. And we'll actually talk a little bit more about iHeartRadio coming up. As far as subscription is concerned, it was a banner year, a banner year for subscription. Apple Music is up at about 20 million subscribers. These are paid subscribers now. Spotify is over 40. And in general, it was a great year for streaming. And that also meant it was a great year for the music business. Spotify is up to a billion streams per week, and that's more streams than YouTube views. So in fact, this whole streaming thing is catching on pretty well. 
streaming is actually changing the way we listen because we're not only listening to the hits, we're listening to catalog from particular artists. And this is what's known as the long tail, and it's something that's been predicted for about 20 years that never really came to pass in retail the way the concept was presented. But now it looks like streaming is actually making that a reality. Another thing that's kind of interesting is the fact that a few very high-powered music execs move from being label and management people to working for online entities. Lear Cohen, who was a big mover and shaker over at Universal, is now a big mover and shaker at YouTube. Troy Carter, who used to be Lady Gaga's manager and John Legend's manager, is doing the same thing at Spotify. And basically what this is, is both of these services figured out that if they had some insiders, then perhaps it would make everything easier when it came to licensing and when it came to actually getting artists to do exclusives. So that's kind of the new strategy on their side. Tidal was probably the first to do this. And of course, Tidal was the first music service to actually begin exclusives. This is Jay-Z's service. Actually, Jay-Z bought it oh, a year and a half ago. And they had Kanye West and Beyonce and, of course, Jay-Z exclusives. And they thought Prince as well. And it turns out that even though they were exclusively streaming the Prince catalog, they didn't have the license for it. Now there's a big lawsuit that's happening. Oops. Tidal really is in trouble, though, because they've been churning users. What that means is the user signs up for a few months and then gets tired of it and moves to somewhere else. And the company's been losing money and is openly up for sale. And what Jay-Z's been trying to do is sell it to Apple, and I don't know why Apple would want it. So I wouldn't be surprised if Tidal went away next year. YouTube Red is a subscription service for YouTube. So in other words, if you want to get rid of the adverts on your videos, if you want to be able to view and listen offline, then you subscribe. I think it's $3.99 a month. The only thing is not many people signed up. Again, why should you? You get it for free. You get used to the ads and you get used to the small inconveniences. And you say to yourself, why should I pay some money when I'm getting it for free and I don't see enough of an advantage to give any kind of amount per month? So YouTube has never released the numbers for Red, which is always a bad sign. Drake was a really big story this year. Drake kind of changed the equation for artists where a really big hit until now, until Drake, was in the hundreds of millions. If you had a huge hit, you're talking 400, 500 million views, 400, 500 million streams. Drake changed everything. It's now a billion. And he broke a billion not only on Spotify, but he broke it on YouTube and he broke it on Apple Music as well. First artist to change things. And he also changed things in another way. Drake kind of doesn't worry about an album. What he does is releases a number of singles, which is the better way to do it in this particular music economy. So the album isn't very big for him. And what that does is it doesn't time to the album cycle of every year or every two years to come out with something. He just comes out on a regular basis, fairly regular basis, and it keeps his fans involved. And we've seen what that does because he has these tremendous numbers that nobody else has. Facebook was in the news, as you would expect, but not for the right reasons. Facebook, in fact, started out the year saying that it was beating YouTube with view numbers and was taking over the lead. And it turns out that all those numbers were wrong. They were all overestimated. The algorithm was kind of lying to them and to us. And also the way everything was measured was way, way different than YouTube. So what we found that's counted as a view on Facebook is not counted on YouTube. So it's really an apple and oranges kind of situation. So now people are less apt to trust those numbers coming from Facebook. That's kind of a big deal. The other thing we found out is that everyone is now spending less time on social media as of 2016. We're spending our time online still, but not so much with social media like we did before. We're spending our time streaming, either audio or video. 
We're spending our time reading news, but we're not spending it on Facebook, Twitter, Snapchat, etc. Don't get me wrong, we're still spending a fair amount of time doing this. It's just that the numbers aren't the same as they were last year. There's somewhat less. The record labels had a banner year in 2016. Revenues up over a billion dollars. Now, what that means is last year was about 15 billion. This year it'll be 16 billion. So you can see it's gone up a whole bunch. And believe me, it's not from sales. It's all from streaming. Almost every country across the board had an increase. The only one that didn't was Japan. And Japan has some arcane rules of how music is consumed. And not only that, there's a social aspect to the consumption that kind of leads more to sales than to online consumption. And in fact, what that has done is depressed the music economy there. But everywhere else is going gangbusters. And streaming is the reason why. The concert business is also way up. And that comes from not only concerts, but it comes from festivals. All over the world, festivals of all types are breaking records, as are normal concerts at amphitheaters, etc. So that business is still up. And it's not just revenue, because ticket prices obviously are getting higher, but it's also the number of bodies and seats. So people are still going and listening to live music. That being said, ticket bots may soon be a thing of the past. We may not see ticket bots anymore. What do I mean by that? The secondary market for tickets is dominated by companies like StubHub that actually have these bots that go out and buy tickets before you can. So in other words, you find out tickets are going on sale for your favorite artist at 10 a.m. and you're online at exactly 10 a.m. and you find there's no more seats left. And that's because the bot got there ahead of you and bought them all up. And then you have to pay a higher price to StubHub or any of the ticket agencies, plus you have to pay the service fee and all that's involved. The good part is that's going to end very soon because there are now laws going into effect to stop that on both state level and federal level as well. So from now on, we're going to have a much easier time getting those primo tickets that we always wanted. Blockchain may be dead as a potential savior of the music business. And if you haven't been following this, Bitcoin is built around a technology called blockchain, which is an encryption technology, and it's very, very strong. The number of proposals that I've seen this year that, that are built around blockchain and claim to save the music business, the, and the reason why, of course, is you would have to pay via Bitcoin in order to listen to music. And in fact, that never caught on, and it won't catch on. And the reason why is someone came up with an editor for blockchain, and what that does, it basically negates the whole business of being able to encrypt something, and no one having the technology be able to beat it made it attractive. But now, <laughs> if you can get an editor, you can beat it, so bye-bye blockchain. EDM finally reached a peak in 2016 as well. It looks like it's not only plateaued, but it's slowing down. We've seen a number of clubs dry up. We've seen some of the festivals not have the attendance that they had previous years. We've seen sales slow down a little bit. We've seen streams slow down a little bit. And now, as a result, you're finding people that produce EDM, and I'm talking more on a record label and a festival level, are now trying to move more into Asia, which hasn't been exposed to it as much yet, in order to keep the sales and keep the revenue up. But everywhere else, EDM has definitely slowed down. So what's gonna be the next trend? Well, you tell me. Another thing that peaked this year is Record Store Day. Record Store Day was a big deal every March because what it did is it promoted the local mom and pop record store. And in the process, it also promoted vinyl. So there are special releases from all of the labels, the major labels and the indie labels. But what also happened this last year is a lot of the mom and pop stores that this whole event was built around basically bailed on it. The reason why was they felt that the labels were pushing them into buying product that they didn't want. And the association that was tied to it would basically say, unless you bought this package of vinyl albums to sell for record store day, we're not going to allow you to promote it. And a lot of them just said, well, screw that. I can't afford to spend this kind of money that you're asking me to. So 
We'll see what happens in 2017, but that's not a good sign for something that was really healthy for the industry. Speaking of vinyl, though, there was a couple of breakthroughs in the manufacturing of vinyl. And of course, there hasn't been anything in vinyl that's changed when it comes to manufacturing in about 40 years. But guess what? The first new record presses finally came off the line. Not only that, there are some brand new technology innovations. One is the way records are pressed. Up until now, they've been hot stamped. So in other words, there's a puck of, oh, kind of warm plastic. It's a ball of plastic, and the stampers come down on either side and squish it, and that's your record. But now there are some new presses that are using injection molding, which is about twice as fast and much more accurate. So we'll get a better record that's going to be faster. And since all the plants have a four to five month waiting period, if you turn the project in now, you're not gonna get it for four months. Cutting this in half is a big deal. The other thing that's actually changing is there's a new process that uses lasers to imprint the stampers, which will not only make things cheaper, but also faster as well. So that's kind of neat that this technology is changing, improving, I should say. And that being said, is vinyl going to take over the world? No, it's still growing. It's not growing as fast as it was. And I think we'll see the numbers at the end of the year when we look back, we'll say, okay, now we can see that in fact things are slowing down there. When it comes to music creation, this was a year for next generation plugins. What do I mean by next generation? Well, I mean plugins that are somewhat automated like Isotope Neutron. And what that does is it figures out a lot of the EQ for you by looking at the other tracks around it. So we're starting to see these next generation plugins that automate a lot of the engineering decisions that we make. I don't think that this is going to replace engineers by any stretch of the imagination. It Hopefully it will make things faster in that it will make an initial decision and maybe get us in the ballpark faster. But now we're seeing these smart plugins coming out and that's certainly an interesting new direction for the business. In 2016, we also saw a lot of big audio companies change and change hands, change directions. For instance, DTS was bought by a technology company. Fairlight had their audio assets bought. Harman was acquired by Samsung, and that's still in the process. We'll see if that goes through. Avid restructured. Tannoy, their production was moved from Scotland. It's been there for 50 years, 60 years, and it was moved to China. That's kind of a shame. Gibson had some financial problems. And in fact, what ended up happening is they sold a couple of buildings in Nashville. Guitar Center is always on the edge. They have a big balloon payment coming up in February, and it'll be interesting to see what happens there. So a lot of these big major companies, and especially companies that are public, are having trouble, mostly because the music business, it's a small niche. And as a result, a public company can't easily survive in this business because a public company is really serving its stockholders where all the other companies, all the boutique companies, all the smaller companies are servicing their customers. So it's a different mindset completely. And let's face it, a public company is not right for this part of the music business. So in 2016, we've seen a lot of different changes happening, a lot of different evolutions happening in different parts of the music business. And we'll get to 2017 in a second. If you have any questions or comments, send them to questions at bobbyownercircle.com. Don't forget to check out my new music producer formula course, as well as my other online video courses at bobbyosinskicourses.com. For more on my music industry and music production blogs, go to bobbyosinski.com and find the links where you can also read excerpts from my books. Okay, predictions for 2017 and beyond. Well, first thing is we're seeing the end of radio as we know it. iHeartRadio, which used to be Clear Channel, is in big trouble. What ended up happening there was the fact that they had some hedge funds buy in a few years ago for real big money based on what they thought was going to happen in the market, and it didn't happen. In fact, what we're seeing now is radios having trouble selling ads. I was listening to the NFL on AM radio a couple weeks ago in prime time. 
And every commercial news pod was dominated by public service announcements, basically free commercials. And we're finding that in radio more and more, mostly because, let's face it, there's a lot of commercials. There's a lot of commercial time. Too much for most listeners. That's because they have to service the debt that has been put into them by big investors like hedge funds. So now we're seeing the end result of all that, and it's not pretty. So we're going to see radio change, and I think in 2017 we're going to start to see the cracks really begin to open up in the business. We're also going to see not the end of Twitter, but Twitter is definitely going to change. A couple years ago we started to see the number of users on Twitter plateau. So we knew that was going to happen. Now we're starting to see Twitter actually shed users. So there's a lot of people that try Twitter and can't get their arms around it and leave. And of course, that's no way to sustain a business. So I think we're seeing Twitter going the other way. And a lot of the people that are on it aren't really happy with it. So don't be surprised if Twitter changes substantially in 2017. We're also going to see the beginning of the end of the album. That sounds like sacrilege, doesn't it? But I'll tell you what, why do you need an album in 2017? What's the point? It's a singles business. We don't listen to albums anymore. We don't sit and listen from one end to the other like we did with the vinyl record, first of all, and then a CD afterwards. Now we listen to our favorite songs in a playlist. So the album is kind of a necessary. Not only that, it takes a long time and a lot of expense to put an album together. And we're starting to see the major artists, and of course, Drake is leading the way with this. We just talked about that a little while ago. Drake is leading the way, and we're starting to see major artists saying, eh, you know, I'll just work single by single and release it when it's finished. And that's a lot better for everybody. The reason why is there's more music coming out for fans. Every time a piece of music comes out, it's a new event that you can promote. And the fans get more of a chance to either like it or dislike it. When you put an album out and you have 10 songs or 12 songs or 14 songs, God forbid, usually it's pretty easy to zero in on one or two that you like and just gloss over the other ones and never listen to them again. And that's getting to be more and more the case. So we're seeing the beginning of the end of the album. We're also seeing the beginning of the end of the guitar amplifier. Boy, that sounds like sacrilege. But you know what? The emulators that are coming out now are so good that we're even having the pros that are not bringing their amplifiers in. And I talk to people all the time that are saying, eh, you know, I have this great amp collection, but all I use is a Line 6 Matrix. Or there's a brand new one by Blue Guitar that's supposed to be fantastic. And there's all of these different emulator plugins, emulator pedals that are just so good that people are using them on stage because now with in ear monitors and really good PAs, you don't need to push air on stage like you used to. So we're seeing the beginning of the end of the guitar amplifier. What's going to be interesting is if this goes on for a generation, then for sure the die is cast because you're going to find the next generation of guitar players that are going to think that amps sound funny and amps don't sound right and that the emulators sound better. So things are changing when it comes to guitar amplification. Look to 2017 to really be a watershed year for modeling microphones. I don't think I would have said this a year ago, but I've become a believer. Modeling microphones actually do work. And they can work better than having a whole collection of classic microphones, especially classic microphones that aren't working well, aren't feeling well. It's harder and harder to find a really good working classic microphone. They've been around for 40 and 50 years and 60 years, and they just don't sound good anymore because the parts wear out. And in many cases, you can't buy those parts any longer. So we're finding that modeling mics have found the best of those particular classic microphones and have modeled those characteristics. And now you can go from one to the other with just a flick of a switch or a flick of the software. We're going to see more in next generation plugins, the automatic plugins. We talked about Neutron, but there's some others coming down the pike that are very similar that are going to really help the mixer out on many levels. Now, of course, it's how you drive it, so I don't expect mixers to be replaced at all. I don't expect engineers to be replaced, but it's going to make their jobs easier, so look out for those. I've talked to a lot of lobbyists 
that work actively in Washington. And they believe that the Trump administration, believe it or not, is actually going to be favorable to laws that are going to favor the music business. The big one, of course, is copyright laws. And we've been trying to get a change and update in copyright law for quite a while and haven't gotten anywhere with that. Some of the lobbyists I talked to that specialized in that area feel that the Trump administration is more open to that. The other area is performance. So right now, if your song is played on the radio, you don't get paid for it. The songwriter gets paid, but the artist doesn't get paid. In Europe, you do, but in the United States, you don't. We've been trying to institute a royalty for about 20 years, and it's been brought down by the NAB, National Association of Broadcasters, at every turn. But the lobbyists who specialize in that kind of feel that the Trump administration may be favorable in that position. So whether you like Donald Trump or not, that might actually be better for musicians. It's predicted that downloads are going to be dead by 2020. Downloads, I think we'll find at the end of the year when we look at the numbers, are way, way, way down. And of course, why would you download something? Why would you download a song? Why would you pay 99 cents for one song when you can pay $9.99 a month and get literally millions and have them at your fingertips anywhere and not clog up your hard drive? So everybody's seeing the usefulness of streaming versus downloads, and that's dropping off quickly, and we're going to see it drop off even more in 2017. It looks like Spotify is going to do an IPO a public offering. They're going to go public, which should be interesting. What that will mean is the investors will get paid off, but it will also mean that we'll get a better look inside Spotify, a better look at the numbers, because they'll have to file the SEC reports. So we'll know a lot more about how Spotify works and what the real numbers are. I think we have a pretty good idea already, but that might help as well. So we'll see if that really helps Spotify or not. Another really big thing on the table is the fact that both YouTube and Spotify are out of license with their label deals. Now, what happens is they sign a licensing deal with all the major labels and the indie labels that allows them to stream their music. Well, guess what? The deal has been over for both YouTube and Spotify, and they're going basically on a month-to-month deal now. That's going to change in the coming year. We're going to see brand new deals. The labels and music publishers would like the royalty rates to go up higher. And we may not see that with Spotify so much, but definitely with YouTube, because YouTube is paying a whole lot less than all the streaming networks. So look for a deal to happen there and look for it to be more in favor of the record labels may not be that much more, but I think you'll start to see something that's a little more fair than it's been before. Look for high-res streaming to really take hold in 2017. Apple has been collecting high-resolution files for about three years now, maybe more, three and a half. And we're starting to see high-res talked about more and more. And I think we're going to find that Apple will start the ball rolling We'll make sure that everything is streamed is in high-res and the other distribution services the other streaming services will have to follow suit. Also look for Facebook to finally share the ad revenue on video. Now, unlike YouTube, which does share their money, their ad revenue with creators, Facebook doesn't do that. Video creators are putting their content on Facebook and not getting paid. Look for that change in 2017. And in fact, we'll start to see some money being made and some real money being made on that platform. And finally, virtual reality hasn't caught on the way everybody kind of thought, and especially at Christmas time here, we all thought it would be a bigger deal than it's turning out to be. There are many, many problems. One is the fact that the horsepower required for really good experience isn't quite available yet. When the horsepower is available, then usually you're tied by wire to the computer, which is not ideal at all. The other thing that's happening is that we haven't really had the killer app yet. That being said, there's a lot more money being actually put into augmented reality, AR, rather than virtual reality. And everyone thinks that that is going to be the killer rapper. and we're going to see that actually break out before virtual reality. So look for 2017 to be the year of augmented reality. So that's what I think is going to happen in 2017. Let me know if you agree or if you have any additions. 
I want to thank you for listening to my Inner Circle podcast. Thank you for subscribing to the list. Thank you for subscribing to all my email lists and to my services, reading my blogs, buying my books. Thank you so much. I appreciate your support more than you know. And I'm always here for you. If you have any questions or comments, please send them to questions at bobbyoinnercircle.com. Don't be afraid because that's what I'm here for. Listen to other episodes of Bobby Osinski's Inner Circle. Go to bobbyosinski.com, select the podcast tab, or go to bobbyoinnercircle.com. Or you can find it on iTunes, Stitcher, Mixcloud, and Google Play. At bobbyosinski.com and bobbyoinnercircle.com, you'll also find a sign-up form for my newsletter and for alerts to new podcasts. This is Bobby Osinski. I will see you in 2017.